and dark, which although vivid to an experience of the site are not often found in the written report. But in addition to this, the actual process, the creation of the image is important, visually testing ideas, illuminating style and structure, and exposing differences of opinion among the contributing specialists. My talk gives examples of these differences and how they contribute to an understanding of the archaeology. I based the talk on illustrations I did for two books on Silvery Hill. First, the excavation report, Silvery Hill, the largest prehistoric mound in Europe, edited by Jim Leary, David Field and Jill Clannan, and the story of Silvery Hill by Jim Leary and David Field. Excavation at Silbury came about after a 10 metre hole unexpectedly opened on the summit of the hill. The remains of shaft dug to the centre in 1776. Prior to conservation in 2007, a tunnel excavated in the 1960s was reopened, enabling new sampling of the biological remains in the turf and topsoil, giving new insights into the environment of the late Neolithic period. The way I did the reconstruction illustrations, firstly for the story of Silbury Hill, book aimed at the general, general public, public, was to read the text, draw some ideas, then develop the ideas with the archaeologists. The roughs, usually pen and ink drawings, were circulated to the various specialists, the archaeobotanists, archaeozoologists, soil scientists and others, and in response to their comments, the picture might be changed, abandoned, or after debate, stay the same. Here are some examples of these ideas. So, Waisley Hill, which lies behind the site of Silvery Hill, was thickly wooded with large new trees. I felt it would contrast between the orange-red colour of the strip natural clay and the dark green foliage of the yews. Dogs on leaves, the detail from the lower organic mound picture. I drew a group of people with dogs walking across the landscape of Silvery Hill, and I drew the dogs on leaves. But it seemed to me that prehistoric dogs might well be on leaves. This seems a small thing, but I don't think further and see that it conveys a lot more, implying a close relationship with humans, which might be wrong. Maybe the dogs would have been more like scavengers, trailing the hunt. So when this was questioned, I removed the leaves. What did the dogs look like? The size and shape of the dogs caused debate. My first drawing of the dogs, at the suggestion, was based on archaeologist Jim Leary's Deerhound widget. Deerhounds are a basic dog shape, a sort of greyhound, not much changed by selective breeding, but they are tall, about 76 centimetres to the shoulder. Neolithic dog skeletons, which are not numerous, and there are none from Silvery, are of dogs smaller than deerhounds, at the most 62 centimetres to the shoulder. On Orkney, though, the passage tomb at Coween Hill contained 24 dog skulls of nearly the date, and these dogs were thought to be the size of a large collie, so quite big dogs. In 2019, one of the dog's heads was reconstructed as human skulls from excavation sometimes are, and the result, wolf-like, is not dissimilar to widget. So I compromised and made the dogs a bit smaller. But the caption to the picture notes that at 62 centimetres to the shoulder, they are the maximum height for dogs of this period, so maybe not as small as the scientists would have liked. Dogs without leaves, small, quite the good time. Pigs too were controversial. In the final phases picture, I show a small pig being driven through the Neolithic grassland. But this was not the first thought. Originally, talking over ideas for the picture with the archaeologist David Field, Dave imagined a picture with hundreds and hundreds of pigs, all rooting and wallowing in the earth. Well, there is some evidence for pigs at Silbury, a burnt pig's tooth and some small fragments of bone. Taking a wider view, the pig population in the later, later Neolithic would seem to be relatively large. There are vast quantities of pig bone from excavations at Durrington Walls and at Mount Pleasant and Marden. At nearby West Kennet Palisaded Enclosure, quantities of animal bone, both cattle and pig, were found, which can be interpreted as evidence of feasting. And this is where Dave's ideas came from. I would have enjoyed drawing lots of pigs, and indeed some of my pictures for the story of Silvery Hill were full of pigs. But representing the scientists, editor Jill Campbell thought this was stretching the evidence too far. The only pig in the picture was to be a dead pig. 
So maybe a small live pig was a fair compromise. What did the Neolithic people look like? In my picture of the gravel mound for the story of Silbury Hill, Dave Field didn't like the way I'd portrayed the Neolithic people. He thought they looked too tribal. At the time, I didn't know he felt like this or I would have redrawn them to reflect his ideas. So for the excavation report, I wanted to get across his opinion. There's hardly any evidence of Neolithic dress. Remains of clothing are rare archeological finds. Some example of, of clothes made of plant fibers have been found preserved in the damp ground of the pile dwellings of the Alpine region. But until 1991, when the glacier mummy was discovered in the Oxal Alps on the French Italian border, there were hardly any garments of leather. A reconstruction of the ice mummy. The ice mummy had clothes of goat's hide, a belt of calf leather, shoes of deer skin, these present a picture of the complex skills of Stone Age knotting and sewing techniques. Of course, conditions in the Alps are different to those at Silbury Hill, so whether his clothing is comparable to people of this period in England is hard to say, but it seems probable that in the choice of materials, their preparation, the skilled construction, in the careful, sometimes decorative stitching, there would be similarities. Dave wanted to show that prehistoric people would dress with care, their clothes might be decorated as the Iceman's coat was with its alternating tones of leather, their hair groomed. They would be people who would consider, plan, possess fine skills, not the rude wild men they're sometimes portrayed as. I tried to reflect this in my pictures. This is a drawing the artist Alan Sorrell did for the Grimes Graves guidebook in 1963, and he shows the, the flint miners as wild men. Nowadays, a reconstruction is more likely to show the Neolithic miners as looking more like us. Sarsen stones, another source of debate. When I was illustrating one of the early phases of the mound for the story of Silbury Hill, Archaeologist Jim Leary talked to me of how he imagined the whole area prior to the construction of the hill as being littered with sarsen stones. Sarsen, you will know, is a sort of sandstone ubiquitous in the upper Kennet Valley. Under periglacial conditions, it was deposited in extensive spreads in the valley bottoms and it can be seen in the banks of the River Kennet. Jim thought of the meadows around the monument as being full of natural accumulations of sarsen, so many stones that you could have gone from Silbury to nearby Avebury, stepping from stone to stone without putting a foot on the ground. Then, before the construction of the lower organic mound in Neolithic times, the stones would have been dragged clear. The very activity of clearing the area, stones pulled to its edge, would have encircled and defined it, creating a special place. I liked this idea and I included it in my pictures. This caused some debate when the roughs were circulated, the problem being that now there are no sarsens in the grasslands around Silbury Hill, and it can't be proved that there ever were any. If there had been, it's likely they would long since have been cleared for agriculture, as they have elsewhere in the Marlborough Downs. Jill Campbell, Jim Leary, Dave Field and I had a visit to Sil Silbury Hill and to nearby Fifield Down, where sarsen stones still litter the area and you can step from stone to stone. We considered the stones and their place in the picture, and as a result, they remained. Ruin times. One way of explaining differences of opinion is in the caption to the illustration. My picture illustrating Dave and Jim's ideas of silvery in Roman times shows the hill as being encompassed by the Romans, drawn into their myths and religions with small shrines and mausoleums on the terraces of the hill. This idea was not accepted by all the Romanist archaeologists at Fort Cumberland, and a long caption to the illustration underlines that it is just one possible interpretation. It's important to know what an illustration is based on, but important too for the archaeologists to express their ideas visually, to give a narrative, to tell a story. An eminent archaeologist once said to me, the thing is, Judith, pictures are powerful, and once they get into people's heads, it's hard to get them out again. Sometimes I have drawn more than one scenario. I did this for the contextualization of the chalk lamp, which was found on the lower terrace of the northern slope of Silbury Hill. This sort of lamp is thought of as late Saxon or Norman, a period when the Danes were raiding deep into southern England. 
I showed it as A I showed it as A, a light for a lookout from Silbury Hill you can see far along the Roman road or B as part of a little shrine lighting a path to the summit embedded in ritual with an offering of fruit and flowers. The caption states that no fruit or flowers were found and they're completely imaginary. My instructions when I first thought of the illustrations was to read the text, draw some ideas, develop the ideas with the archaeologists. Reading the text, what stood out was the significance of the various components, the colours and textures of different soils. Archaeologist Julian Thomas thought of the hill as a collage, growing gradually and incrementally bigger, a gathering of different substances, nothing accidental, always meaning to the people who brought them to Silbury, and that the, and that the process, the physical activity of construction was important, not just the end produce. And I find it very touching that for people who had no written record, perhaps the intention was that the makers of the hill should be seen, known and remembered in this way, which of course they have been, for we are talking about them now.